afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Monash Tech Talks digital health webinar. My name is Emily Rice, and I'm going to be your host of this virtual event over the next hour. I'm very privileged to be joined by two leaders in the digital health field. Joining us today, we have Professor Chris Bain and Dr. Louise Shaper. Now, Professor Bain is Monash University's inaugural professor of practice in digital health. He's a seasoned clinician with more than 25 years healthcare experience and a respected IT and information systems specialist. Dr. Louise Shaper is CEO of the Australasian Institute of Digital Health. She's a world leader in health informatics and digital health and a self-described evangelist for the transformation of healthcare through technology and information. My interest in digital health stems from my role as a medical reporter with Nine News. Over the years, I've, I've covered countless stories about technology, digital health, and the way things are advancing, but very slowly. However, this pandemic has prompted a digital revolution, hopefully on a grand scale, and we'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Now, this is such a huge area, and we're gonna focus on three key areas over the next hour. What is digital health and its areas of application? How has digital health been harnessed during the pandemic? And finally, we'll discuss some examples of these innovations at work now and in the future. We will focus where possible on the positives. There are lots of problems with digital health, but the future does look quite exciting. And of course, with COVID, these things are rapidly developing. As I said, I'm a journo, so I'm very conscious of deadlines and an hour, particularly online, goes really, really quickly. So we'll try and keep things moving. And so to keep things moving, let's start. I guess we need to start by defining really what we're talking about. Um, so for both Chris and Louise, can you give us a, a summary of what digital health is and its areas of application? We'll start with you, Chris, and if you can keep it kind of short, that'd be great. No worries. Thanks, Emily. This is actually a question when I came to the uni about two years ago, I really needed to concentrate on. There's lots of definitions floating around. As you hear Louise and I talk, you'll probably uh, get a sense of we can clearly distinguish it from the old health IT of the past, e-health. But the definition I use is the use of digital tools and interventions in healthcare and wellness. So one simple sentence. Well done. Okay, Louise. See if you can match that with simplicity. <laughs> I don't know. The challenge is there. Um, so I, uh, I don't think I can be as concise as Chris, but I do agree with his definition. And I think if you think about the context of healthcare, um, and this is where digital health really will come into its own, and we're not, we're just at the precipice now. We've, we've really just scratched the surface. And in previous years, when we've talked, as Chris mentioned, about health IT or e-health, we've talked about IT, computer systems, data systems, that have been built some specifically for health and others for other purposes and we've applied them to health and we're like okay how can we use these technologies to do a better job of uh, providing high quality care digital health flips that completely and so now what we're talking about is as we all know our I'm coming at you via Zoom um, and all of you are uh, probably at yeah, your homes right now and uh, telling the kids to be quiet. So, you know, digital has just invaded every part of our lives and that has some really positive consequences as well as some challenges uh, with that. So digital is everywhere. So when we talk about digital health, the flipping part is instead of applying health uh, technologies to healthcare, we're now talking about how does health exist in a digital world? So it's quite a different concept. So it's more integrated than just being something, a separate Absolutely. part of healthcare. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, let's dive into the first couple of questions. And um, I think let's talk about the application in terms of really going back to basics, monitoring and information management. Louise, let's put aside COVID for now because we'll, we'll go into that in more detail soon. But how do you think or how is the technology being used to optimise electronic medical records or information management more generally? Yeah, great. It's a great question and a really good one to start with. So thank you, Emily. Um, so I'm not sure because there's hundreds of people on the call. So I'll give a generic answer. Some of you will know these, this already and others it might be news. But most of healthcare still runs on paper. 
So we have, um, so you go to your GP, um, well in the old days when you used to be able to visit a GP in person and they, they will type something about you on a computer and there's 98% of our general practice became computerised in terms of its uh, electronic medical records, uh, you know, back in the 90s that started. So that's sort of everywhere now. Um, and then as you yourself, if you think about you and your family's journeys throughout the healthcare system, you will see and you would have experienced varying degrees of of computerization um, and some things that probably frustrate you as well. So um, most of health still runs on paper and then the, the bits that are digitalized are still exist in silos. So mm -hmm. for a, a great example yeah. is that because we do see our GPs uh, type information, uh, clinical information about us into a computer, but we don't have access to that, uh, generally speaking, as the patient, we don't have access to it. But we sort of uh, generally think that, oh, well, if I get into a car crash today and get rushed to hospital, they'll know about my diabetes mm. and they'll know about that drug that I take for that rare condition because they expect, as you would, that that information is shared with appropriate privacy and security protocols, of course, in place so that the key clinical people that need that information about you can access it. And that is just not the case at all. So um, so uh, there is there are fantastic opportunities happening all around Australia. As I said, GPs are, are very uh, digital already, but it's just not shared. Um, allied health and specialists, almost non-existent. Hospitals uh, across Australia, and you would know again, um, viewer, as your own experience, that varies. So, but there are um, various projects and they're, they're very expensive. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars being spent in digitalizing the healthcare system just for that basics. You know, we're not talking about the fancy stuff at the moment. We're just talking about getting information as me as a patient into my hands as a patient and into the hands of the clinicians who with my authority can access it to provide the best care. Uh, so that work is happening across the field, but we have still got a long way to go. Chris, I, I was gonna give you another question, but just on that, on, um, on monitoring and, and records management, are we, and Chris always answered this one, how far behind are we in Australia? Are there other countries that are actually, that are doing this really well? The short answer is there are other countries doing it very well. The common denominator is money and the passage of time. If we just focus down, at, I, I mean, I completely agree with Louise's assessment. It's what I call a lumpy environment. You know, varies from where you go in the Australian healthcare system. If we just look at hospitals, there are metrics that say, for instance, we are several hundred times behind the US. And there's lots of problems in the US, but in terms of electronic medical record rollout, the numbers of installations, the depth of the installations, it's that kind of time period, even if we had all the money in the world now. Um, so on that front, we're a long way behind and we need to learn from their mistakes. Uh, but there are absolutely other countries. We hear really good things out of Israel in terms of pure digital health. We hear really good things out of the, the Northern Hemisphere and Scandinavia around more systemic healthcare information systems. There's lots we can learn from from overseas, for sure. Well, Chris, um, let's talk about health monitoring. Um, even without the information management, those basic systems there, like um, electronic medical records that everyone has access to, what, what things are happening in terms of health monitoring that are impressive, that are actually working at the moment? Can you give us some examples of some things that are actually working in that space? Yeah, so a lot of the examples I use are actually from overseas, Emily. Um, and I tend to talk about things that are actually real. They're not a futurist thought bubble. They're real and there's data around them and so forth. And I might just quickly make the bridge from my one line definition to an example I'll give you. So when I give that one line definition, I then say, well, these sort of six hallmarks, if you like, the more a product or a project or a computer system has these six hallmarks, then the more it looks like digital health to me. So one of them is patient engagement. One of them is what I call augmented intelligence, which is more than just AI. One of them is mobile phones or smartphones, apps, sensors, and digital biomarkers, or turning things about us into ones and zeros for digital health. A really good example is a, is a product called Cardia 
by a company called Alive Core. And I've had multiple people in Australia come up to me after I speak about this and say, I use this. So it's clearly available here, right? And what it basically is, and it's been going for many years as it's evolved, is the ability to measure a cardiograph just off a couple of metal probes, like a postage stamp size, onto your mobile phone, and then have it analysed in the cloud. So that they're starting to automatically diagnose some heart conditions. And this has actually had a big prominence in the setting of uh, COVID because of some of the uh, suggested drug cures that have been floating around are known to have problems on heart conduction. So this product has even got more of an airing in that setting. What are the, sorry, oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, you, you say it's it started overseas, but there are people using it here in Australia. Absolutely, absolutely, that's right. Because these are, if you like, getting into the product space. You know, buy now, sign up here, and if all you need is to download an app and then they ship you these little probes, then it can be done. Now, there's good and bad in that, but but people are doing it, and there's no barriers to stopping people. But the reason I mention that one is there's now about 80 published scientific papers about that system. Wow. Both its foundational solidity and the implications of using it in the healthcare system. And people can go and find that and read it and verify for themselves. It's not all sales. Mm. And, and when we're using things like Cardia and sensor technology and it's driven by the patient or consumer, we'll get into that topic soon, is it as reliable as the data that comes out of, you know, going to hospital and putting a, you know, getting on an ECG machine? Look, I, I think the evidence on the cardio front is for what they're saying it does, yes it is. And I think that's not accidental, I think that's because there's a cardiologist who's led that initiative and they've followed, unlike some tech companies, really followed the classical medical model of let's slowly, progressively prove that this is reliable and trustworthy and we can therefore make assumptions of it. So for instance, the last time I checked, and this is many months ago, they had 50 million ECG in their store, right? And that just goes up every single day. So again, that's what that public release of that science is for. So people can go, sure, I, I get it. We can see that what you're claiming has actually got validity to Mm. Well, that's fantastic. And I'm sure that, um, you know, cardiologists would be grateful to be able to see what's happening with their patient's heart without having to worry about an appointment every... It, it, it's, a, it's a mixed field. Some cardiologists, absolutely, and I'm sure some not so much. Great. Well, let's move on to diagnostics and treatments. And I know we are navigating our way through these topics fairly quickly, but again, we, we do have question time later, so we can come back to a lot of these issues. Um, let's, um, Louise, talk about, uh, I guess, treatments, um, just because we've just heard from Chris, but are there systems already improving treatment outcomes that, that you know of or things that need some more backing that could be switched on straight away? How are we, how are we faring in, in the realm of actual treatment? Yeah, generally speaking, um, there is some, and you know, Chris has mentioned one, there is a lot of really fabulous work done uh, globally in this space. Um, the challenge is the data. So, um, so even for artificial intelligence or, you know, anything that needs data, where do they get that data from? Um, and we've already covered that a lot of that information is actually in paper records. Mm. Um, and a lot of the information, uh, when it becomes digital, we can analyse it better. But the stats there also can also be really scary. So I was uh, looking at some work that was done in primary care recently and the word anxiety, and there's only one way to spell anxiety correctly. Um, but this study had over 600 uh, different spellings of anxiety that they found. And so because of typos, effectively. Um, so who knew? Um, and I tweeted that out, actually, and someone replied back with another study that they were aware of that had over, oh, was it 28,000 or 30,000 like, of another like simple, relatively simple word that had typos. So um, so uh, when so this is why the robots aren't taking over anytime soon 
room for any of you who are worried about that. There's just there's, there's a lot of work we have to do first. So so um, so getting the information into a digital format is is fantastic um, because that means that we can analyze it. And uh, I know we'll talk about some COVID examples as well. Um, but uh, but that data needs to be accurate because how we can't learn from it if it's not accurate. Like if you literally went into looking at that GP study and you just typed in the word anxiety, you'd be like, oh, actually, the anxiety isn't much of an issue in, in this particular um, population because not many people have it. Um, but you just look, but then you look at all the determinants, the different ways to spell anxiety and, and it comes up. So, um, but there are, uh, so I think if we get that right and when we get it right, I shouldn't say if, it'll be really exciting. Um, a, a bigger picture example would be that, uh, you know, I don't know the figures off the top of my head, but there are literally hundreds of millions of dollars spent globally every year looking at uh, cures for cancer and understanding cancer more and how our research systems are centered is you know Chris and I run uh, we're both cancer researchers uh, and um, we might even work at the same university or the same city or we could be on opposite sides of the plane um, and we might be researching quite similar things but when um, the way the research is funded and, and set up is to put us in competition to each other and we work really hard we spend money that we've been given to come up and, and be the first ones and then and then when it goes then we publish our information and it gets into and that takes years to get into circulation mm -hmm. um, of studies um, and then and then Chris might read that and go oh well if they're doing that well then hey I can build on that that takes too long so um, a really fantastic example for digital health is when we digitalize this information is looking at research protocols and uh, clinical trials to actually look at fast tracking improvements in our understanding of disease and disability and actually looking at fast tracking, uh, you know, uh, ways to treat those things versus the very slow way that it's done now. And collaboration where possible. I mean, I know sometimes competition is good because it, it actually drives um, productivity, but in, in terms of having these great minds, like you were, mentioned the word silos before, working in these silos, again, if, if somehow that digital healthcare can actually connect all those people, imagine how quickly we could make advances. And I mean, again, we'll talk about this very shortly when we go into COVID and, COVID and, and, and uh, vaccine research, I'm sure. Um, Chris, moving on, we hear a lot about AI. Um, it's this sort of still this scary thing that's, that we, we can't quite get our heads, heads around yet. But, but how now is artificial intelligence actually being used, perhaps in diagnoses or, or more broadly in digital health? Is this something that's happening in this, again? Are we, is, is it happening here or is it happening overseas? And it, is it something that we need to be frightened of or is it actually going to help? I might answer the first, the last question first, Emily. I, sure. I, that's why I deliberately, and there's others around the world doing this, some of whom I've spoken to, praising AI in this setting of augmented intelligence. The point of AI, artificial intelligence, in healthcare is to make people's jobs easier, to aid their decision making, uh, not really to replace anyone. And I think that gets a bit lost when we talk about AI. And sometimes augmenting their ability is something more like virtual reality or augmented reality. It's not always AI. Um, absolutely, as an example in Australia, a really clear cut one is a uh, product called Life Whisperer, uh, which is a, out of a small startup in Australia. And that's using AI to look at uh, embryo selection in, uh, in vitro fertilization. So trying to augment the ability of humans to pick viable embryos in essence, I understand. Um, another good example, uh, sort of back to the EMR space, I think it's called MedAware out of Israel, which is getting a look in in the States. And that's done something interesting by trawling over lots of electronic medical record data after people have made decisions, for instance, about drug prescribing, and yet it's still finding, even with the inbuilt alerts in those systems, lots of problems. So drugs that were you know, giving someone with, a, with an ulcer a blood thinner, which is a no-no because they can bleed internally, things like that. So it's adding an extra value above a system that should already work. Um, another really interesting study I saw out of China, probably a year old now, is using a... AI-supported uh, colonoscopy system for looking at bowel tumours 
and the AI actually improves human, it doubles human performance in the ability wow. to pick up nasty polyps. So that's again, it's not replacing anyone, but it's it's standardizing performance and giving an additional boost to performance. And standardizing pathology, I'm sure, which is really important right now. Um, thanks for those examples. That, that it's really effective, particularly with such a broad topic, to be able to use anecdotes and use examples because it, it is such a huge field and so often we get bogged down in what's not happening. If we can talk about the things that are actually working, it's, it, it, it really does help boost our enthusiasm, I guess, and, and hope for the future. Well, we can't talk about the future without talking about the big white germ in the room, <laughs> coronavirus. Um, Chris, one of the things that I, we were discussing uh, off air before we, before we went live is, is telehealth. And I don't want to get too bogged down in telehealth. This is really just, I guess, an example of how um, the pandemic has accelerated one part of digital health, which is telehealth. Telehealth is such a terrible word for it because it sounds like we're on the, we're on the phone and uh, like the old, the old landlines. But just tell us a little bit about what do you think the pandemic has done in terms of telehealth and, and where might we head after this, after this is all over? Yeah, so it's clearly um, opened the door to much more telehealth in Australia by design. Um, you know, the government's funded it in a way they've never done before, primarily out of safety concerns for both patients and uh, healthcare professionals. Um, I think there's a fascinating period after it appears we're back to business as usual in terms of COVID infection is where does that leave us? And are we gonna go back to where we started or are we gonna go back to some midpoint? I think it's incredibly optimistic to think that the current level of telehealth operation will continue like this after COVID. And in fact, it could be even dangerous to do so. Um, there's a really interesting example popped in the media about a week ago from this thing from RPA in Sydney called RPA Virtual, which I thought was, wasn't was set up for COVID, but they quickly pivoted to make it work for COVID. And it's a really good example using cutting edge but robust tech to manage people remotely beyond just being able to talk to them and see them. So I think that's real, that kind of stuff's really exciting. Yeah, it needs integration. Um, uh, we've got a comment here from Navin on, on the chat box. Um, agreed, healthcare industry has a sea of data that's not utilised effectively. I, I, I'm assuming you might agree with that, Louise. And, you know, in terms of information sharing and all our data, has COVID improved data sharing? I know things have happened pretty quickly. We've had to, um, I guess, make quick, the governments have had to make quick decisions with using a mountain of data. Has this helped things, Louise, do you think? Have we moved quickly? Yeah. Yes, um, look, it really has. And, um, and I must say the healthcare system, um, the clinicians, as well as the executives and managers, like everyone, and epidemiologists, like the innovation that they've been able to turn around um, almost on a dime uh, is, is really incredible and, and really needs to be uh, lauded um, because, you know, it's, it's a tough environment that they're working in. Um, a couple of examples of data sharing, which is really good, is the Australian eHealth Research Centre at CSIRO have actually built an Australian COVID dashboard. So they've looked at all the data sources they can get their hands on um, through uh, the jurisdictions and looking at compiling it into a dashboard so that that information can actually be used by health planners, by governments, by hospitals uh, uh, to actually plan out and really track what's happening with uh, COVID in Australia. So, you know, that that's an example of data sharing that's happened very quickly. Um, and I know that they've, they've been getting a lot of uh, a lot of kudos for that work to being able to do uh, that through CSIRO. Um, another example is actually something that Monash is a part of, which um, is the, it's uh, $4 million have been spent on developing a clinical data and analytics platform, which really took, um, takes real time data, as we sort of already described, we, there, there isn't any such thing in healthcare at the moment, mostly in terms of real time data collection and, and sharing as appropriately. Um, and COVID has actually kick-started this project. Uh, Chris, you may, you've probably got more details than I do on it, uh, but that's a really exciting initiative. Yeah, Chris, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Or are yes. you actually? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, certainly it's come together in unprecedented time given the scale. It's at least three states, it's multiple agencies, it's right down to uni levels. So that's 
definitely been facilitated by COVID. Uh, having said that, it's also using some approaches that um, uh, hopefully got a life well beyond COVID. Uh, in our particular case, our expertise in it is through a, an expert in our faculty called Anne Nicholson, who's an expert in Bayesian techniques, which is sort of a, a subset of AI, if you like, and um, being able to more dynamically model what might happen to patients that factors in things beyond data. So current best expert evidence, current papers and so forth. And that kind of infrastructure the project might leave behind has got a life well beyond the COVID epidemic. Mm. It was interesting, um, you know, talking about data and your white, the white paper from um, your institute, Louise, talks about the fact that data, health data is not just going to be what comes from your GP, what comes from the hospital. It's, it's, it's about what's coming from the patient or the client, from their homes, from, from society. It's not just uh, a one, one area of data coming, coming from your doctor or your GP or from the healthcare sector. It's actually more societal. It's coming from everywhere. And I guess that the challenge is going to be actually converging all that data and making sure it's used in a useful way. Um, Louise, what, do you think that the data sharing that's occurred, uh, has, it, has COVID actually broken down some barriers? Has it enabled data sharing to happen more easily? I mean, every day we, we hear on the news that the updates of how many cases there are. I mean, prior to this pandemic, for me to get information out of the health department would have taken days, if not weeks, you know, or, or an FOI request. Yeah. Is data sharing, you know, are people getting more accepting of actually sharing data? Uh, oh, absolutely they are. I mean, if anything, this, this pandemic has really shone a light on those silos um, and, uh, and of information siloing, uh, but, they, but also the need to open those up with appropriate protocols in place. So we don't want to go, oh, well, it's an emergency situation, forget about ethics and privacy and all that sort of stuff, of course. Uh, but um, we've been able to show, well, the healthcare sector has been able to show how they can um, quite rapidly um, really uh, look at not just sharing the data, but starting, people are already starting to think about what data do we need to collect? In what format? How do we get access to that data um, to collect it in the first place? And like you said, it can come from all sorts of sources. And then how do we harness that data to actually turn it into actionable insights so that, you know, together in collaboration, the healthcare team and, and the consumer or the patient can actually make the best decisions about the care that they need. Um, and of course, with COVID, uh, that has actually become on a global scale now. So instead of just looking at how my information can be used to help me right now in this episode of care, um, where we're starting to think, and it's real, people are living it every day, is how can my episode of care and the information gathered about me be used to inform how the hospital down the road treats the person with the same patient? Um, and then looking at it at a global health perspective, at population health level. Uh, and I, I foresee some great things in our future uh, because we've shown that we can do quite amazing things in a short period of time. So imagine when we've got time to plan this out properly, what we can do. Well, so I did hear one comment um, from a digital health expert overseas saying the changes they've seen in this pandemic, things that may have taken a decade to get across the line, have now been able to be done in days, if not hours in some cases. So it, it is possible. It's just whether there's the will to have it done. Um, Chris, we did, uh, and Louise, you mentioned privacy there because it's all wonderful to have all this information, but we still need to respect privacy and, and privacy laws. So um, in terms of privacy, there was a lot of talk around privacy in the COVID Safe app. So, and prior to this, prior to the pandemic, we had the My Health Record where there was a, there was a huge debates about privacy. So Chris, can you, I guess, see any disparity between how the COVID Safe app has been adopted in terms of privacy concerns in comparison to my health record? What do you think the positives are that have come out of the COVID Safe app? Uh, I must just say I haven't downloaded it, which you might want to <laughs> later. But whereas I was a basically an advocate for my health record, I think they're chalk and cheese, even from a privacy point of view. So it's very clear that um, you know, and even independent experts are looking at this, even privacy settings. There's minimal data being collected about you in the COVID Safe app. 
from. It's not really about you. It's about whether you went near somebody else at a certain point in time and keeping a record of that, um, you know, versus the My Health record, which is, you know, if it's fully reaches its potential or it fully becomes what it could do, covers all sorts of information about you in much more detail from multiple sources. So in some people's eyes, it's a honeypot. So it's a chalk and cheese conversation. I mean, despite me not um, downloading the COVID Safe app, I think you know there's not a lot of harm to an individual in downloading it if they want to contribute to that issue. And um, my health record, we heard a lot of criticism of that. Has has it actually now that the, the pandemic's kind of taken the focus off of it? Has has that? I guess people put aside their privacy concerns. Are more people actually making the most of that resource now? Yeah, I don't know. It's a very interesting question to ask because there's all sorts of interesting things happened in the healthcare sector since COVID that we're hearing anecdotally, even in terms of who's turning up for care and who isn't. And that will be one of the list, you know, adding to the list of questions for us to try and have a look at once it settles down again. Did people use the My Health Record more? Mm. You know, don't know is the answer, but it's an interesting question. I do think Always that make. question, yeah, and I, I agree, Chris, but the question needs to be asked and, and that um, research will be really interesting at, at various levels. Um, as an example, I attended a webinar at the beginning of this pandemic, which was focused around uh, clinicians who have never done telehealth before, having a quick download of how do I do telehealth? Mm. And, um, and something that even I've been doing stuff for like 20 years, that still made me smile because I'd never actually considered that this would still be a problem in 2020 is there was a clinician who asked a question in the chat that um, so they um, they for their own safety uh, want to be a GP working from home and delivering care and like they've, they've, they're willing to do that they've watched why they showed up to this webinar they don't this particular GP didn't have access to their medical records of their patients because even though they're typing them into the computer they're not in the cloud um, and I and and so as an example, that I mean, they should be in the cloud. But at the same time, if the GP logged into the My Health record, at least there should be some semblance of a summary information about me, so that, that you know so you're not just going in blind. So there are um, there are certain use cases for My Health record that uh, would have surfaced as a result of the pandemic. Well, we'll talk more about the pandemic in the questions, but just to. to um, to finish up on our discussions before we open to questions, um, and while you're still up, Louise, can you suggest or, or give us any examples of digital health innovations that are making a difference now or on the cusp of it? Um, you know, whether that's COVID related or not, what's what for you is exciting you at the moment in terms of this space? Okay, um, and yes, could definitely talk about that. So I, I have thought, I, I wondered whether that question would come up. So for all which ones will I pick? Um, well, I'll pick one because it's, it's actually already been mentioned in passing, but it's really critical. And you mentioned it first, Emily, was the idea that instead of the old way of running a healthcare system, which is we make sick people go to a facility somewhere um, and and at that, at that healthcare facility, information is harvested from them. Whether someone asks me a question and I give it or I get my blood pressure taken or I get an MRI. Like, so this idea of that's, the data comes from me um, while I'm actually in that physical uh, building. Uh, but in health, where we, we will see rapid change uh, is that those, uh, they need to be obviously medical grade, because so my Fitbit is not medical grade, uh, but there are aspects to the Apple Watch that are medical grade as an example. And there is money to be made for, you know, Apple has shown that, Fitbit has shown that, Fitbit's just been wanting to be bought out by Google. So, so there's money to be made. So if we can get um, consumer price devices that are medical, collecting medical grade information, um, that actually can be harnessed for the benefit of providing patient care, um, for me to know more about myself um, and for my clinicians to know more about me so that they can make the best decisions. That is a complete game changer. That will redefine how we actually deliver healthcare in uh, in this century. Um, and because of the the financial models that are attached to things like consumer grade um, consumer uh, wearables that are medical grade, as I said, these large companies that have 
more money than God, um, uh, want to play in this space and they are playing in this space. Mm. So, and they've got money to burn, right? So that when they work it out, they'll go, oh, that didn't work. All right, we'll try this. And um, they'll keep doing the R&D until they get it right. And then I'll be able to go to JB Hi-Fi and buy something that my doctor will might actually prescribe to me. Um, and the doctor won't doesn't just want an Excel spreadsheet of a million data rows, but with beautiful dashboards integrated into other medical. That's the thing I'm really excited about because it, it redefines the entire paradigm of healthcare. But even at the most basic levels, when people start, you know, when, when I started doing stories about Fitbits five years ago, it was like, whoa, this is amazing. And people really loved engaging in their own, I only got this much sleep or I got that. And some of the, some of the technology was a bit clunky and maybe it didn't quite record properly, but it showed that people are interested and want to take control of their health. Mm. Um, Chris, what about you? What, what, what's exciting you at the moment? Oh, look, I think it's a similar spin on what Louise is saying. I'm really excited to see where we end up on telehealth nationally. And I'm really excited to see the next incarnation of that, like RPA digital, right? So, you know, there are a couple of exceptions floating around, but most telehealth consultations that we're seeing currently and have in the past in Australia are exactly what we're doing here. And whilst you can ask patients to do certain things at the other end of the, the line, there, there, there is always a barrier and it differs by condition about how far you can take that. But if I can do smarter things using all this technology, and I'll give you some examples, like, like cardio monitoring of an ECG remotely, then suddenly we can do more and more services more and more safely. The RPA digital, uh, RPA virtual is a good example. So that, you know, this is usable, stable technology. They've got a patch for measuring temperature. They've got a wireless oximeter, just like a little peg on the end of someone's figure that measures oxygen levels in the blood and pulse. We start to put those things together as well as an ability to talk to you and see you. All sorts of things become possible. They happen to have used this in COVID, but... Think of people with pneumonia going home a day or two early because the nurse can come and give them antibiotics and we can monitor them. Common condition called cellulitis with infections of the leg, treating them out at home. Although we've done that a lot, um, you know, post-operative infections. Otherwise, you keep them another three days, but you can monitor them safely. All sorts of things become possible when we can put more stuff down the wires, basically. And I think having got greater on the ground acceptance for telehealth, maybe we can boost from there to this new place. Well, thanks, Chris and Louise, for, for answering my questions. Now we'll open up to our attendees, and there's some great questions here. This, the first one we'll kick off is very broad, um, but I think it's, it's what I guess a lot of people are concerned about, particularly those who aren't digital natives. I must admit I'm not a digital native. Um, Louise, I'll put this to you. Will the digital transformation be able to replace human touch ever in terms of health service? Never. The closer it, the closest it's going to get is haptic technology, which um, is very early days, where you can wear like a glove and and um, and it gets sensation that you feel. Um, but that's you know that's quite still quite futuristic. But no, it will never replace human care. And I think you'd find be hard pressed to find uh, a digital health advocate like Chris and I who would say that it would be. Um, but it fills it can fill gaps. So at the moment we have massive problems in healthcare in terms of equ equitable um, availability of services. Um, my parents live only two hours from a, a, a capital city um, and my dad has massive health problems. Um, he should be seeing clinic, clinic, clinicians a lot more frequently than he is able to. Um, if he can do that, basically through his television, um, and then only see someone in person when um, when the clinician and him decide it's actually critical to have that in-person visit, my dad would be in a better shape of care right now. Um, but no, it will never actually replace it. I would like to think that us humans are pretty irreplaceable. And I think Chris has, has alluded to that a few times when he's been speaking about telehealth, that yes, it's great, but you know, you probably do need to see someone in person to detect those things that, you know, you can't quite detect over a, over a computer screen. Um, when we, we talked earlier about um, getting these electronic medical records, everyone on the same page, so to speak, um, different hospitals have different uh, PAS systems. How can hospitals and clinics consolidate the use of their use of their systems? I know I've done a lot. Um, I've talked a lot in the past with procurement 
um, hospital procurement experts. And the problem there is getting the system, them all in the one system. First of all, to everyone to agree to use the same system. How can we actually get everyone on the same page? Chris, would, do you have any expertise in this area? This one's from, um, from an anonymous uh, attendee. Yeah, so we're sort of deliberately having to gloss over a bit of detail, but um, I, especially in Victoria, where hospitals can sort of do their own thing historically about their IT system, a bit different in other states. The thought of getting everyone on the same system, um, that just that isn't real. The problem is called interoperability, and it's a global problem about sharing data between electronic silos. Louise and I both know a man who's done more than anyone else to <laughs> help that in recent years, who actually comes from Melbourne. Um, and this is through a thing called FIRE, which is a new, well, relatively new web-based way of sharing healthcare data. It's not perfect, but it seems to be offering more real world opportunity in this space than anything we've seen before. So that's the more likely outcome that people continue to buy diverse systems, hopefully, less diverse as we go on, but we reliably and safely share the data between them. Mm. Yeah, and just to comment on that, thank you, Chris, I agree completely. And yes, a shout out to Fire, the Fire community, <laughs> Graham Grieve, because he's a legend. Uh, but uh, yeah, like if, the fact that if I give you any of you, if I tell you what my phone number is now, you know, providing you write it down correctly, that you can call me day and night. You know, I might not be happy, but I can, there's no technical barrier. Um, and in healthcare, we've, um, uh, because of, uh, so yes, a much not longer conversation, but uh, that's not necessarily the case. So there are even hospitals where one, um, the IT system in the emergency department doesn't actually talk to the, to the IT system that's even branded the same in on the ward. You know, like, and, and so if we can fix the data standards behind all of this so that you don't need to know, am I, is that a Telstra line or is that an Optus line? Have I got a Samsung phone? You don't need to know any of that because all of the telecommunication companies decided many years ago to use the same standards so that all of our technology can talk to each other. And we will get there with healthcare. Mm. Um, we've got a question from Dino. Um, what tech innovations can you see making a real difference in the next uh, two to five years in the ever broadening service model supporting aged care? Um, this obviously is an area that's really been hit hard um, by COVID. Um, Louise, have you got anything on that? Or if you don't, throw it over to um, it's it's one of those. I mean, when, are we going to be like Japan in a few years and have robots instead of nurses tending to our um, mothers and fathers and grand grandparents? I would like to think that we can do a better job of harnessing the smarts behind those robots to bring the community and, and family together rather than just farm them out to be uh, to be looked after by robots. Um, there's a great movie called uh, Robot and or Frank and the Robot or Robot and I, something like that. If you check it out, it's a really good one actually. It talks, it looks at it looks at that exact scenario and and the elderly gentleman flips the use of the robot on its head. It's it's really funny. Uh, but anyway, aside from movie recommendations, um, telehealth will be a really important thing as well. So I know we've talked about that already, uh, but it's actually, it's a real problem trying to get our clinicians to visit aged care facilities for a bunch of reasons. So if we can actually um, increase the effectiveness and the efficiency, and that, as I said, improve that accessibility issue through telehealth, that, that will have a big uh, impact in aged care. Um, a question for you, Chris, from Derek. Why is the cost of adapting to new emerging tech so high? Um, and how complicated is it? What do you think, Chris? What is there a simple answer to that? Is it just because it's it's government run? Do we need Amazon? Do we need Facebook? Do we need Apple to, to jump in and take over? Yeah, look, it's not a simple answer. There's, I'll list a series of factors that are at play though. One is money, one is culture. Um, and I don't necessarily mean all the bad elements of culture. You know, healthcare is rooted in science, especially from the medical perspective. What's the evidence that X is going to work? Sometimes people use that as a bat to hit innovation with, though. Um, they're two big things. And, and also disconnectedness. So, you know, we have a disconnected health system. In many ways, we have disconnected governance, uh, you know, government, mm -hmm. which this is a symptom of. So 
all of those things work against rapidly bringing in innovations and using the latest tech as does legacy, but none of them are reasons not to try, I don't think. Yeah. Um, we've, we've got, and this is still on the same, um, same topic from Anonymous. Um, this, Anonymous has put this statement forward. Some countries have achieved a lot more in digital health be, and their adoption rate is higher because privacy laws are not as strict. So is it fair to say advancement in digital health must incur a trade-off of privacy? What do you think, Chris? And Louise, I'll get you on this later because I'm sure you've been asked about this. Do we have to give up? Do we have to risk some of our privacy? I've sort of said things publicly before in a general way that, you know, there's no such thing as absolute privacy in general, let alone uh, when we're talking technology, let alone in healthcare. And I think people have to find the happy ground as individuals they're, they're prepared to live with. Um, if you want absolute privacy when it comes to technology, don't use any, any, any technology at all and go live in a cave in Gippsland. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, because that's sort of where we're at, right? So, mm. so the issue is we need to educate people more about the true risks and dangers and, you know, but also if you want to take an absolute view on privacy, you're selling yourself short on other things and you, people need to understand that in making those decisions. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I agree completely, Chris. And it's not necessarily a trade-off. It's, um, well, I'll use my dad as an example. So he's in rural Western Australia. I'm in Melbourne. Um, and he is very unwell, but he's of the generation that she'll be right. There's nothing wrong with me. And sometimes I think he actually believes that. Um, so really great for my father in terms of his cognitive dissonance about actually what's going on. But um, I, um, I, he is completely off the grid. So he doesn't live in a cave, but he doesn't have the internet. He doesn't have a smartphone. Mm. He has an analog television, you know, so, so dad's um, information is definitely secure and uh, private uh, and it's locked away hardly in computers. So I actually, um, I, 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 I want, to, I want to be able to help my dad remotely. So I need to actually understand because I, I wonder whether he is, um, whether he actually understands what the doctors tell him or whether he, or, or whether he just goes above his head. Um, and so I asked him if he would grant me access to his My Health record because then at least I'd, I'd know what drugs he's on and, and look at and that sort of stuff. Um, I thought I was going to have to convince my dad about that and I had all my arguments ready to go. He said, yes, not a problem. Um, so I was really surprised. And so I had to actually set up his account for him remotely because, uh, you know, he doesn't have the computer. Um, I still don't have access to my dad's My Health record. Where it fell down was... Um, for a, for a, so that you can say you are who you are, say you are, um, I need to give the bank, uh, the dad's bank details, like where the Medicare payments go. And he refused to give me his bank account number. And when I explained, dad, they already, the government has your bank account details. That's how they put the money in there. <laughs> just about ID. Hey, yeah. now, I still, to this day, and even when I sneakily said to my mum, can you just give me the numbers, please? She said, oh, I couldn't go out against your father. So, so, so you know, it's a, a funny story from my family, but the, 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 interest, the thing is there, it's about education. So my dad, um, you know, I, I didn't make a difference. Um, so he, he doesn't really understand um, information privacy. And the other thing that um, the majority of people, even though they won't be, they won't be my dad's level of ignorance, ignorance um, is that most people have no idea how dangerous healthcare is. The healthcare system is the third leading cause of death, the third leading. So it's way above COVID, it's way above uh, car crashes. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's only a couple of things, which is I think COPD uh, and, um, and cancer above. Uh, so the idea that healthcare um, by its very risky nature is just unsafe. Um, and a lot of that, um, those misadventures that people have in the healthcare system that can cause death um, or ad adverse events is because clinicians don't have access to the information mm. they need about you to make. If everyone understood that and, and, they, and then they, they actually opted out and didn't want to share their information, then that's, that's cool. I really appreciate people's, but 
to the fact that most people don't understand that very fact and how many people, like we're talking 14,000 people dying every year mm. in the healthcare system, mm. not because they're sick, but because they're in the healthcare system. Well, yeah. and Emily, just, just yeah. another way to phrase it just quickly. I mean, to date, and sure, an electronic future may be different, but to date, we've had clearly many more problems arise for patients by an inability to share information yeah. than we have had from an oversharing of information. Mm -hmm. Many more. Yeah, just even something as simple as um, not being able to, for people's medication to get mixed up. I mean, uh, you know, oh, case in, yeah, you're talking about your father, Louise, I'm talking about my, my grandmother, sorry, sorry, Nana. But, you know, the different things that she's self-prescribing, if that was all in one, uh, one portal, that every doctor, every single, you know, doctor she shops around and <laughs> goes to talk to, they'd be able to see what's going wrong. But yes, well, yes. moving on. Sorry, Louise, go for oh, it. I was just going to add just a, a statistic that uh, we had someone present at our conference a couple of years ago, and I recently rewatched her talk because um, I thought I, in my head, I, if the number was so high, I thought, oh, I probably misremembered that. So I watched it again. And no, she, um, she was uh, uh, she, uh, a lady about 58 years old, had a stroke, so uh, got rushed to hospital. Um, and she uh, took herself out of hospital after nine days. And there's a whole story behind it. But anyway, she was determined to get access to her medical record of that stay. So not her whole life's medical record, just of that nine days in the hospital. There were 72 errors Wow. 72, including her date of birth was wrong oh by, by 20 years or something. Wow. So I think if people knew this, it would, it would um, like Chris said, there is much more harm being done to people because the information isn't where it needs to be. Uh, and mm. I think that's terrifying for anybody who has responsibility for another person's life. Well, we've got a question from Frada. Um, can you comment, and I'll leave this open to either of you, on the opportunity for a paradigm shift from... EBP to personalised health as a basis for medical decision making. Are doctors willing to do it? Um, if you could extrapolate on that. Chris? Uh, I think there is. Thank you for your question, Frada. <laughs> uh, I think there is. Um, I think to get to that place, uh, digital health is essential in the way Louise and I are talking about digital health. Um, there's still a lot of cultural barriers and this sort of talks to that point I mentioned in those six hallmarks of patient engagement. Getting to a point where patient, or in patient empowerment, where patients are as empowered as they can be, as they want to be at an individual level for helping manage their own healthcare, um, not only needs all that technology to work and the privacy to work and all that stuff, but it needs a cultural willingness on the part of healthcare practitioners to alter how they view the world. And that's a mixed thing. You know, you could line a hundred up in a room and you get a range of responses to whether they're prepared to do that or not. That percentage will change in time. So question yet to be answered. Yeah, it mm. will. And uh, yeah, and a couple of um, really good quotes that relate to that topic, Frada, and thanks for the excellent question. Um, and yeah, like certainly not demonising those people who choose not to, but it's it's the way that it starts with the way that we train clinicians um, and that, and it's just giving them a lecture on digital health or consumer empowerment isn't going to change the culture of medicine. Um, and, and the culture of medicine is there um, as it, it's been the same way for hundreds of years for a really important point because until relatively recently, really with the onset of computers, uh, tech, the sharing technology uh, for that the internet has allowed, until then, yeah, Chris went to medical school and spent a really long time in medical school where he was getting as much information that was available only in libraries that only a select few people mm. have access to into his head. So that when a patient shows up, he can sift through it and go, oh, cool, I think I've got the answer here. Um, and, 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 so, it's only been in the last uh, 20 years that we've had the ability to share information much more widely than the select few. So it was really important that that happened because, uh, but now it, it takes a while to shift culture. Um, but one, uh, a good, a really good quote that I, I love a lot, um, there's uh, one of the world's leading uh, health informaticians who studied artificial intelligence like in the 60s. He, um, he died last year, his name's Warner Black uh, from Boston and Warner used to say that any doctor that can be replaced by a computer deserves to be 
Um, <laughs> and, you know, so the point is you should be harnessing these tools to improve your care. You should be harnessing the information. Um, if, if you, and if you're not needed and a computer can do that, then you should question your own value. So, but it's going to take time to get there. But we're, we're heading in the right direction. Well, one thing we haven't talked about are the med tech companies. We've talked a lot about governments and, and, our, and our big and our other big um, tech companies. So Marion wants to put this forward. Um, obviously, moving forward involves multiple stakeholders, new sectors entering the market. What role do traditional med tech companies have in this evolution and what are their responsibilities? Big question, I know. Um, but are they moving fast enough? I think there's examples of med tech companies doing that. So somewhere, something like uh, ResMed. Uh, so, I, you know, they've come from ventilators and CPAP machines and things like that. And I believe we're Australian from the start. Um, they're doing all sorts of interesting things about apps and automatically diagnosing conditions through breast sounds that are, you know, AI runs over. I think some of the companies that work in diabetes uh, technology, glucose monitors and so forth are also doing similar things. So some are for sure. And it's arguably that's a good thing. Um, as long as again, we have the right sort of regulation and evaluation. Yeah. Are they too restrained? Do you think, I know compared to the U S we are quite conservative when it comes to healthcare and drug approvals and clinical trials. How do we get that balance right between protecting the consumer or the patient and allowing these med tech companies to, to implement these radical digital health changes? Yeah, it's an ongoing balance. If I had to, to my, my gut feel of it at the minute is we need to maybe make it a little easier or more transparent for them in the Australian setting at the minute, but then we need to walk along a fence line and keep seeing how that's going quite closely in the coming years. So, you know, an oxymoron perhaps, but adaptable regulation. Mm, I, I agree that adaptable regulation is, is what's really key here. So, um, so yes, the US uh, generally, um, and we're sort of seeing in their response to COVID a real live tangible example of what happens when you have marked complete well, not complete, but, you know, market deregulation. Um, so even uh, with the GFC, uh, um, you know, 10 years, so years ago, the US was hit much harder than us because we actually regulate our banks and we've learned mm. through the Royal Commission that we should do a better job of that. Um, and, uh, but still, at least we had a level of regulation. So we didn't have the sort of, you know, more market cowboy stuff that was happening in the US and other parts of the world. Um, uh, but, if, but also regulation can stymie innovation. It's not meant to, though. So um, one of the things that governments can do that no one else can do is actually set those regulatory frameworks in place and procurement rules, which are really important. So, for instance, um, we mentioned this fire standard before. So if, you know, pick a standard, let's go with fire for this purpose of this demonstration. But um, if the government said, okay, we will happy buy off small companies, big companies, new players in the marketplace, people who have been here for 50 years, but you have, which, but we'll only look at your um, technology if you meet these standards, which is a common thing. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, we don't allow anyone with a new seatbelt to install it. Like there's regulations. If a new company comes out with a seatbelt that meets the regulations, I'm sure the car manufacturers look at that. Um, so we just have to apply a similar approach where we regulate the standards um, and uh, make sure that that's in place um, and encourage the market to adopt those. Um, and, and they will. So that I think that's a really important role um, to even encourage collaboration between some of the new players who have a lot of new ideas and new technologies um, that are probably looking at, I don't understand why this is so hard, you know, <laughs> maybe they've come up with some solutions already, um, but teaming them up with people who have actually done the hard yards uh, and actually understand the, the wicked problem that is healthcare, then we're going to get more innovation and better results for, for all of us as citizens. Well, to keep on that positive note, Suzanne's got a question, um, uh, pretty, pretty straightforward one, but a big one. What project are you working on at the moment that most excites you? And um, whoever wants to go first, Chris, are you champing at the bit? Is there something? Or a, no, you go apart, first, from, apart from whatever you're doing in ISO at home, but <laughs> in terms of digital health, what, what's, or what can you see that looks exciting at the moment? 
You got one up your sleeve, Louise. I'm trying to decide which one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll stretch it out. Um, <laughs> it might not be as exciting for everybody, but considering that there's, I imagine that there's a lot of people on this call that actually work at a university, I hope you guys find this exciting. And that's upskilling the workforce. You know, mm. like the fact that you can go through, I, I trained as an occupational therapy. Um, I have a PhD. Like everything that I know about digital health, to be honest, I'm self-taught. Um, most of us are self-taught uh, and, and I'm not saying you need undergraduate specialisations in it yet. We might get there one day. But um, so where the thing that um, I'm really excited on working um, with the Institute and we is effectively upskilling the workforce and helping in, helping individuals to chart career paths for them. There are a lot of people, um, whether they're medically trained or others, that uh, didn't know that you could do have a career in digital health. And so they're discovering that and we want to help them along those journeys and we want to help employers uh, to actually work out how to build their teams, how to upskill the people so that a lot of these, uh, you know, some of the cultural challenges and things that we've touched on already, um, that people won't, people will be more uh, embracing because they'll understand uh, that this isn't about installing a computer system, this is about harnessing a computer system to manage the information to deliver better patient care. So I'm really excited about that. I mean, it's inevitable. I've read a stat that by 2030, which is only 10 years time, God forbid, 65% of the workforce generally are going to be digital natives. So surely they're going to demand this sort of change. And, you know, how do we educate that next generation uh, that's coming through the healthcare system? Um, Louise or Chris, do you see um, AR or VR being able to supplement online learning. I mean, it's already happening, we know, in some surgical spaces. Um, how will that help in terms of education, particularly in, in the rural segments of our, um, I guess, healthcare student population? Yeah, look, and there's people who I know on the call who are much, much more experts at AR and VR than I am, but um, I think there's pockets of it for sure. And there's already been a lot of, uh, irrespective of the label of digital health, a lot of use of virtual reality in training for procedures, mm. the hands-on stuff in healthcare, from more undergraduate stuff to surgeons to anatomy lessons to all sorts of stuff. So there's, certainly in Monash, there's a long history of that and um, it will keep having a role. Um, you know, interestingly, I've got a few projects in answer to your previous question, but there is work we're doing with our medical colleagues about that very issue that um, Louise mentioned. Um, so people in our medical faculty are working very closely with me about trying to frame what that education around digital health looks like. One of the challenges that's not really visible until you come into the university is just how crowded a medical curriculum, for instance, is. Yeah. So for everything else you've got to put in or you want to put in, you have to find a space, which usually means something else going out. So that, that's a challenge. But yeah, AR and BR will keep having a role in healthcare education. And more interestingly, from my point of view, in healthcare delivery, there's some really interesting stuff in that space. Yeah, well, even a, a really cool couple of cool examples. There's a, 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 a woman from New Zealand, I think, who's at Stanford, who uh, is looking at how we can use those types of technologies to teach surgery to nurses, and so people who have some medical training, but you know they're not trained to be surgeons, um, for uh, you know rural and remote uh, instances, or like even um, virtual midwifery can be done uh, now uh, if we harness technology instead of it's uh, you know just a generic GP out on the Royal Flying Doctor's plane. Uh, so those types of things will, we will see more of, which is pretty cool. I've got one more specific question before we start trying to wrap up a little bit, but this is from Michael. And um, if, if I, no, hopefully one of you can uh, feel that you've got the expertise for it. Um, do you have any more detail, Chris or Louise, on the local Melbourne group working with FHIR? Don't know about oh, that. Oh, sure, story. sure. Yeah, okay. Um, well, if people are interested in that, I'm one person they can contact. We've last week just had a, um, a meet-up session with some other partners about people in Melbourne interested in fire. So probably the quickest route through that is to speak to me. We're doing work on it, but there's all sorts of other people around doing work on it and always happy to, to refer on. Right. And, um, and just a quick shout out to the Australian eHealth Research Centre in Brisbane has probably uh, led the nation in terms of an entity doing it so they can be contacted. Mm. 
I've got a question from Anonymous. What are the state and federal authorities um, doing in terms of helping small IT and digital startups and getting their innovations, prototypes or ideas into our healthcare industry? I mean, it must be, it's going to get a pretty crowded sort of um, field soon if you've, got, if, you, if you've got startups competing with people like Amazon and Apple and, and Facebook. Um, are there policies in place or are we just still, so our government's just focused on getting through this pandemic at the moment? Yeah, and how we're going to pay for it all. <laughs> um, but mm -hmm. that aside, um, yeah, look, I wish I had a really great answer. There's some really good stuff happening. Um, there are organisations like here in Melbourne and Health, which is a, a federally funded organisation. Um, its sole purpose is digital health, um, you know, as startups. Um, and helping those people uh, in the startup world, specifically around digital health, commercialise, uh, get, you know, real results, uh, that sort of thing. So, you know, they're doing a great job and there's a lot of universities that do this work as well, including in, in Melbourne. Um, so, but the, the tricky thing is that even particularly for those organisations to get uh, decent VC funding, they usually, VCs, uh, venture capitalists will usually want to say, okay, well, okay, yep, the technology looks great. I'm loving the pitch. I think I, there's a position for that. Yep, I'm happy to fund it. Come back and talk to me and I'll give you some money once you've got 5,000 users, mm. you know, because they need that data. And and that is the still real challenge because um, generally our healthcare system, which at least at the hospital level is, you know, very much uh, government funded, those procurement proto uh, pro protocols are challenging. Uh, so it's it's not easy. And it's not easy just like for startups, whether they're in healthcare or somewhere else, you know, to get, it's like when you go for a job and they say you need experience. Well, how can I get experience if, unless I, you give me a go? So yeah, it's, it's going to be a crowded field. Well, I think we're probably just about getting to the end of our allotted time. And before we go, I'm going to take the, take the floor back. And, and I want to ask Chris and Louise, just a, a final question for you. Why should we be excited about a future? where healthcare is a mix of digital and human-centric care. Um, and even if you want to give some examples here, but what excites you about the future of, of, of digital health? Um, Chris, I'll, I'll put you on the spot there. You know, how is this actually going to help us be a healthier society? Uh, the answer to that sort of lies a little, uh, Emily, in why are we having this conversation? And so we're having this conversation here and nationally and internationally because most people in charge of healthcare systems realise they can't keep going the way they are. Uh, they cost too much. They're not doing as much as we'd like for the money put into them. Um, they're not sustainable as workforce shortages come in and demand keeps rising. So I think the most exciting thing is the nutshell is digital health is probably one of the only things I could see in the right mix as actually fixing these systemic problems in the Western healthcare model. Mm -hmm. oh, and I was basically going to say the same thing because, you know, if we, when we get this right, and it is a journey, it's not going to happen overnight, but we can have a healthcare system that remembers us. <laughs> How radical is that? Um, and it shouldn't be. And, and we can have all the care that we want and need. We just need to organise it better. And do you think... Do you think that this pandemic is going to help or hinder that? Um, Chris, if you want to take that yeah, on. Yeah, I, I think it's broken down barriers that we've known have been around for a time. So in that sense, it can only help. I, I'm still going to be fascinated to see where we land in a year from now, assuming there's no second wave. Where is it? Where's our new baseline? And can we push forward from a new baseline? Yeah, and you, Louise? I agree, absolutely helping. And I've even, you know, I've dedicated my life to this. I've been astounded. Like we've heard the government, you know, when this started, it was, all right, we'll allow a little bit more telehealth. And then a couple of days later, there's another press conference. Okay, we'll do a bit more telehealth. And then in the end, it was like, all right, <laughs> everyone can do telehealth. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, um, and, you know, congratulations for everybody, you know, Greg Hunt, Health Minister, Michael Kidd uh, and Brenda Murphy and everyone behind the scenes who made that happen. It's, it's transformational and, and really incredible. Um, but they also said at that press conference that, uh, you know, they've done 20 years worth of, uh, you know, innovation and work 
fast in or 10 years in 10 days. And that's actually not the case. This actually work has been happening for 20 years, <laughs> but they just decided to remove the barriers and, and let it happen. Um, so, uh, so I think that, um, and now we've got Greg Hunt, who has actually said this publicly, that, you know, he is very interested as health minister looking at how we don't have to go back, like wind it, completely back, uh, you know, uh, how can we actually make telehealth a standard uh, model of care in Australia? And he said publicly he wants to look at that over the coming months. So that in itself as well is incredible. Yeah, we can't live through something like this without making some positive change. And I, I think hopefully this has been the impetus um, to get the ball rolling in these areas. Well, I can't believe it, but we've already gone over time. So I, unfortunately, I haven't been able to get to all the questions. Thank you so much for all our attendees for your great questions and thank you all for attending. Um, the webinar has been recorded, so you can re-watch it um, once it's posted to the Monash Tech Talk site. Um, before we go, can I thank the team from the Faculty of Information Technology for all their work behind the scenes in arranging today's event. And attendees, if you'd like to give us um, some feedback, um, your honest opinions are welcome, good or bad. Um, we're going to send you a link on email for a feedback survey. Um, you can also give us some feedback via the chat box or go to monash.edu forward slash it forward slash mtt. Um, thank you again, Chris and Louise. Your insights are fantastic. I feel as though we've barely even skimmed the surface of, surface of this topic, but I really appreciate uh, your positive outlook because for so long, and particularly in health, we can really get bogged down in the problems, and there are a lot of problems, but it's great to look forward and, and to stay positive and to take, as I said, something positive out of what's been such a terrible situation. A fascinating topic and I can't wait to see some of the innovations that are coming through and I'm sure from some of our students at Monash with, um, that are in the healthcare sector and what they bring forward. Thanks again, everyone. It always feels weird to sort of just switch off and go, but um, stay safe, stay well, and where you can stay home, I think that's still the message. And thank you very much for all your contributions, Louise, Chris, and all our attendees. It's, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Emily.